and ask you please to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. We continue where we left off last Sunday night with verses 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Let's ask God's blessing on our time in His Word. Father in heaven, Your Word is amazing, beautiful, powerful, living and active, sweet to our taste, if indeed we know Your Son. Lord, we know Your Word is able to bring change to our lives, but only when we learn it in the power of Your Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask You to be our teacher this morning. Deal with our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we said last Sunday night, when you come to the 10th verse of Ephesians chapter 6, you come not only to the close of this great letter when he says in verse 10, finally. He's not just saying, this is the last thing I have to say, though certainly this is the last section. But you come to a section in verses 10 and following that puts the rest of the letter into its proper perspective. He's taken us from the beginning of the Christian life to the end. From God's choice in eternity past to our inheritance in eternity future. It's taken us from the highest and loftiest doctrines to the most practical, down-to-earth decisions we have to make every day. From God's choice of us for salvation to the choices we make every day in marriage, raising children, labor relationships. And after describing this life that we've been given in Christ in all of its beauty and all of its wonder and all of its glory, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. That is, this wonderful, glorious life you've been given must be lived out in this temporal age in the midst of a very real battlefield. Oh, it's a glorious life, but it's not without a struggle. And you must live this life in the midst of a very real battlefield, and you have a very real enemy. And there are things that are really at stake. Praise the Lord, the ultimate outcome has already been settled. And if we're a Christian, we walk in the victory that the captain of our salvation has already won for us. There's no doubt about your eternal future, no doubt about your inheritance. But make no mistake about it, there are real things at stake in this temporal age in which we live. Really things to gain and really things to lose. And the need is that we must stand in the midst of this battle. That's what he's telling us to do. Be, do everything you can do to be sure that you stand. He's not told us to let go and let God. And at the same time, He's made very plain that your strength is not sufficient. God has a provision for you both of strength and of armor. And every day, you and I are to be responsible to make sure that we're putting on that armor and walking in that provision that God has given to us. You're in a very real battle with spiritual, unseen forces if you're a Christian. And I want us to think about that some more this morning. 
And my first point this morning, the first thing I'd like us to think about together is this is the world as it really is. What he's describing to us here, when he tells us that there is a real personal devil, when he tells us that the devil has forces that work along with him, when he talks about the powers and the rulers, the world forces of this darkness, when he talks about all this that we can't see, that we would never know if God had not told us, you understand He is, he is revealing to us, God is giving us in His Word the world as it really exists. This is what really is going on around us every day. We just can't see it. And right away we have to recognize that there are people who would scoff at that. They would say, uh, Preacher, this is the year 2003. Are you really going to talk about the devil? Are you really going to talk about evil spirits? I mean, this is fairy tale stuff, isn't it? This is the stuff of legends and myth. This is the kind of stuff that human beings have made up to try to explain their problems. We're living in a different age. We're living in an intelligent time. We don't have to talk about the devil and demons, do we? Well, just know that if you believe the Bible and if you're a, a, a real Christian, if you've really trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can't think in the way that I've just described. Now, if you believe the Bible, then you don't see your world through natural humanistic eyes. You see the world that you live in through the eyes of God's truth. And it is God who has told us here and in other places in Scripture that this is the world, this is the universe as it really is. Standing behind the world system, standing behind the ways of lost humanity, standing behind the philosophies and the false religion that characterize this world, there's a chieftain. There's a ruler and he has agents. Rulers and ranks and legions that assist him in his evil work. This is what the Bible tells us. The Bible teaches, in fact, that the whole world is in His power, the devil. Now realize our God is sovereign and He rules over all things, including the devil and His work. But one of the things we have to be very careful of when we talk about the Bible, we have to be careful of taking one truth to mean that other truths are canceled out. I find this sometimes, especially in the lives of those people who believe in the sovereignty of God. They take the sovereignty of God in their mind and their thinking to almost cancel out other truths revealed in Scripture. Human responsibility, for example. One truth can qualify another truth. One truth can put another truth in its proper perspective. But one truth from the Word of God will never cancel out another truth from the Word of God because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And while God is sovereign and rules over all things, the Bible still says that this lost and dying world, lost humanity and the world system around us, it is under the power of Satan. That's a reality. 1 John 5.18 says, We know that no one who is born of God sins, that is, as a lifestyle, continuously, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we're of God. Now listen, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The Bible says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And it's a very descriptive word. That word there, lies, means to the picture is asleep. Like in the lap of Satan. There's the world. 2 Corinthians 4.3 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel, the, of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. There, Satan is referred to as the God of this world. Earlier in this book we've been studying, Ephesians chapter 2. Look back there and look at verse 1. Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you... Christian, in your past life before you knew Christ, here was your condition. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, how did you live when you were in that condition? Verse 2, in which you formerly walked 
according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's Satan. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan is. And you walked according to him. He goes on to say, "...of the Spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by birth, children of wrath, even as the rest." You see, when we come to Ephesians 6, he's telling Christians, you've got this battle on your hands, and it's with the devil and with unseen forces, but realize something, Christians are not the only ones who know the activity of Satan. Because every non-Christian is currently under his power. And the whole world system, this, this floating mass of thoughts and beliefs and philosophies that all argue against God, they all reflect the nature, the character of the devil. He's active in the lives of people who reject the gospel. In Matthew 13, 19, it says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. Matthew 13, 38 says, And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. When the Apostle Paul was called into the ministry, when he was saved and commissioned into the ministry, here's what the Lord told him, Acts 26.16, "...but arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you've seen, but also to to the things in which I will appear to you." delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. And what was going to be Paul's ministry? Verse 18, "...to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light..." Now listen, "...and from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Me." When someone is saved, they go from one dominion to another, from one ruler to another. In fact, it's not too strong to say, from one slavery to another. And so, Satan, this is the world as it really is. The world is in the power, under the power of Satan. How do you explain evil in this world? How do you explain the thinking, the perspectives of lost humanity? the philosophies that take root all around us, that argue against God? How do you explain the false doctrines that ruin people spiritually? Yes, you you explain those things in part by just the sinfulness of, of humanity, but the Bible also explains it by the activity of Satan and demons. 1 Timothy 4.1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. There's the sinfulness of man, but there's the activity of Satan. So, what is the world really like? Well, the world is under the power of Satan. The Bible also says this, though, that the believer has been delivered from his power. What does it mean that you've been saved? It means that you've been saved from the guilt of your sin. Yes. The wrath of God. Yes. Saved from hell? Yes. Saved from an old, unredeemed nature? Yes. But you've also been saved from the power of Satan. Set free. Delivered. No longer in bondage to Him. No longer in bondage under, under His dominion. Colossians 1.13 says this, For He delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Do you ever stop and really think about that? When you think about your salvation, be honest this morning about your thinking. When you think about your salvation, I know you think about being forgiven of your sins. 
I know you think about being delivered from hell. I know you think about going to heaven one day. But do you ever stop and really realize that you were once under the dominion of Satan and God transferred you from that dominion into the kingdom of His beloved Son? Do you think about that? That's what salvation is. Delivered from His power. No longer His slave. No longer walking according to the course of this world. No longer walking according to the prince of the power of the air. No longer walking according to the spirit of disobedience that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. No, you've been delivered. You've been set free. However, the Bible also teaches, this is the world as it really is, World's under His dominion, Satan's dominion, but I've been set free. I've been delivered, transferred in the kingdom of God's Son. But here's the world as it really is. I still have Him, Satan, as my enemy in the present. We still have a spiritual enemy. And you know what? The apostles were not shy or hesitant about asserting that. In 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Paul wrote, For we wanted to come to you, to the Thessalonians, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan thwarted us. He didn't hesitate to say, there's a real devil, and he thwarted us in our attempts to minister to you. 1 Corinthians 7.5, speaking of believers being sexually faithful to one another in the, in the context of marriage, it says this, Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, lest... Satan tempts you because of your lack of self-control. You mean there's a real tempter? You mean a, a personal devil tempts us? Yes. 2 Corinthians 2.10 says, But whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan for we are not ignorant of His schemes. Now, there's New Testament Christianity. There's first century Christianity. Here's the apostles saying, we realize that Satan, and by the way, when he refers to Satan, he doesn't mean that you and I are tempted directly by Satan in every instance, but, he, but, but Satan stands behind all of his forces. So we're coming in contact with His forces all the time, and he's, he was able to say this, we are not ignorant of His schemes. Can the believer in the year 2003 say the same thing? Can we say that because of the Word of God, what God has revealed to us, we are being educated about our enemy and we are not ignorant of His schemes? 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul writes, And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Keep me from exalting myself. Paul had a thorn in the flesh and he recognized it was the work of the devil. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be of sober spirit. Christian, all of us, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And by the way, when he writes there a roaring lion, he didn't mean to indicate a toothless one. I've heard that taught that way before. Well, you know, the, the old lions roar and then you run to the, you know, the prey runs away and then the young lions... Well, I think you're trying to read too much National Geographic into the, <laughs> into the Scriptures. No, he roars as the king of his jungle, so to speak, and he's a very dangerous enemy. And we're, that's why he says be sober. That's why he says be alert. Because your adversary, the devil, is on the prowl. Prowls about like a roaring lion. Dangerous animal seeking someone to devour. Kind of tough to do that if you're toothless. Devour. And so the Bible teaches us that we have this real enemy. Now, what do we know about him? What do we know about His person? What do we know about His power? Well, a few things we can mention. First of all, we know this. He's greater than us. Your enemy is greater than man. It is, it is a, a shame. It reveals great biblical ignorance when people go around rebuking the devil directly. 
And you hear professing Christians doing this. You know, well, I just rebuke Satan. Can I tell you, my friend, you're in no position to rebuke Satan directly. He's greater than you are in power. In fact, I believe the Scriptures indicate He's greater than the holy angels in power. Where do you get that from? The book of Jude. The ninth verse says, But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, there is the archangel Michael, and he doesn't directly rebuke Satan. He says, the Lord rebuke you. Our enemy is greater than man. Our enemy is greater than the holy angels, but he is not greater than God. He is not divine. And this, this is a great error in the church of our time, of our day. This idea that you have a dualistic universe with God and Satan basically being on equal footing. And they're not. The devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. The devil is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at all times, all places at all times. He's not omnipotent. He doesn't possess all power. God alone is God. The devil is not greater than God. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them false teachers. How? Because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. Who's in the world? Who's at work behind the false teachers? The devil. But who's in you? The Lord Jesus Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit. And greater is he who's in you, God, than he who is in the world. And so this is the right mindset as we talk about this battle. I have a real enemy. He's dangerous. I must be sober. I must be alert. He's greater than I am. He's greater than even the holy angels are in terms of power. But God has given me His Son. God has given me His Spirit. Greater is He who's in me than He who's in the world. And God has given me His strength. And God has given me an arsenal. He's given me His armor so that I have everything I need to be able to stand firm in the midst of this battle. And the outcome has already been settled by the great Captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's the right perspective. Now, the Bible also tells us not only about Satan's person and power, the Bible tells us about his purpose and about his activity. What is the devil doing in this world? Well, one of the things he's doing is he's deceiving. He's a deceiver. 2 Corinthians 11.14 If you don't want to be ignorant of his schemes, then realize he, one of the things he's going to do is he's going to deceive. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says this, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. People will sometimes say about members of a cult or false teachers, well, they're so nice. And they're so moral. And they seem to have such loving families. And they, they were willing to be my friend. Don't you realize Satan disguises himself as an angel of light? Revelation 12.9, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. What are demons? They are fallen angels. So he's a deceiver. He's also, the Bible teaches, he's a murderer. John 8.44, Jesus said, You're of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Wherever he, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. So he's not only a murderer, he's a liar too. The Bible teaches he's an accuser. Revelation 12.10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. If you want to know how Satan accuses, all you have to do is read the book of Job, right? There you have a great example. He's an accuser. He's a destroyer. 
Revelation 9.11, they have His King over them, the Angel of the Abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in the Greek, He has the name Apollyon. And both those words have to do with destroyer. He's a devourer. We read that earlier, 1 Peter 5.8. He's a tempter. Matthew 4.3, in fact, refers to Him that way. And the tempter came and said to Him, the Son of God, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. The Bible refers to Him there as the tempter. 1 Thessalonians 3, five says, For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labors should be in vain. Do you notice something about all these verses? You notice the first century church did not have a devil-less Christianity, did they? They didn't have a Christianity that was just about moral reform and changing your life and making yourself better and memorizing the Scriptures and there's no personal enemy here. That's not New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity is we have an enemy. And we're not to be ignorant of his schemes. Because he is a schemer. We read that earlier. In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. He is someone who entraps. He lays snares. 2 Timothy 2.26 And they may come to their senses. Here's why we patiently teach the Word of God even to those who oppose themselves. That they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. There he speaks of lost men and women being delivered by the gospel that we preach because they've been held in the snare of Satan. They've been held captive by him to do his will. 1 Timothy 3 7, speaking of a pastor, says he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he may not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 6 9 says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. One of the snares that Satan loves to set is the snare of earthly gain. And he doesn't work alone, as we've said earlier. He has hordes of helpers in this evil work who obey his directives. They're at work in the world. Now, this is the world as it really is, you see. And only a believer can see it Because only a believer believes the Bible and the only place and the only way you'll ever be able to see it is not with your physical eyes. You have to believe what the Scriptures say. But isn't it amazing once you believe the Bible, you can can recognize that kind of activity in the world, can't you? Which leads to the second point this morning. Not only the world as it really is, but then we have to ask a question. How does the natural world, how does natural man see the world? This is the world as the Bible reveals it, with a real spiritual battle going on, unseen. But how does the natural man see the world? How does he explain evil? How does he explain the lifestyles that destroy the very people who live them? Certainly not in this way, right? The lost world tries to explain what's going on around us psychologically. All of our problems just meet, must be in the way that we think, you see. Have you, ever, have you ever lived in a time with more counseling than the time we live in? I'm going to go see my counselor. I'm going to go see my therapist. It's like the whole world's in counseling. 150 years ago, our great-grandparents out there working the farm, who was their counselor? Can you tell me? I mean, who was their counselor? Do you think the whole world was running to a council 150 years ago? Why is it that counseling has become such a major thing in our world? Because lost man sees all these problems. You've got, to, you've got to see the problems, right? You have murder. You have theft. You have, you have all sorts of, of things that go on where people are hurting one another, destroying themselves. How do we explain it? The world says, well, it just must be in our brains. It just must be a psychological issue. It must be the way we were raised. Our past hurts. If they don't explain it psychologically, they try to explain it physiologically. And that's why we have this explosion of new diseases that our great-grandparents would have never recognized as diseases. Right? If you drink too much, you've got what? A disease. 
The Bible does not treat drunkenness in that way, does it? The Bible treats it as a sin. And there are all sorts of diseases now you hear about. Sexual diseases. Substance diseases. The Bible calls it sin. And the only way to deal with sin is through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. It is for an almighty God to set you free from the bondage to those kinds of sins. He can do it. But you see, you can't come to Christ for the deliverance you need from those kinds of sins if you think it's just a physical problem. The world explains it psychologically, physiologically, sociologically. It's all about where we were raised, what home we grew up in, who we hang around, you see. And there's no doubt there is an influence found through people, but ultimately you cannot explain sin away by influence. Because you've got to ask a question, why is it that the whole world has the same problem? You can go anywhere all over the world, and what do you find? You find sin. It doesn't matter where you travel. It doesn't matter who you meet. It is a universal problem. It can't be explained sociologically. And so some people explain it also by the problems we face, by fate. Well, it's just our fate, you know. Things were determined. Who determined it? Well, we don't know who determined it. Just some unseen force. And we all have a path that we were meant to walk and we all end up where we were meant to be. And it's just fate. Other people say, no, it's not fate. It's luck. Some people are lucky. Other people are not lucky. Then other people have tried to, to, to explain this world mystically. The stars, how they're arranged, all sorts of false gods. Listen, the Bible declares that there was a great fall at the suggestion of a real devil. And ever since that time, men are born into this world estranged from God and with wicked hearts. And this tempter rules over them and holds them as slaves. And what mankind needs is a deliverance from sin and from Satan and from self. And the Bible teaches there's only one deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we preach the good news concerning Him so that men and women can be delivered. Oh, how we need to see salvation is not just some legal matter on paper. Yes, I hear the facts. Yes, I'm willing to sign up. Yeah, I want my insurance. Yeah, I want to go to heaven. No, to become a Christian is to be set free from the power of Satan and sin and self delivered. And this is the need of human beings. And so the world as it really is, is not recognized by the world that is so in need of Jesus Christ, the world tries to explain it away in every other imaginable way. In fact, you know, if you just stop and think about it logically, how does the world remain as optimistic as it does? I mean, we've been working on this problem over 6,000 years. We're going to have world peace. We're going to have people overcome their problems. I mean, 6,000 years we've been working on it. We don't have it yet. And people are going to give their whole lives to trying to figure this out over 6,000 years of history proving we can't figure it out. You see, the Bible is true. The problem is much, much deeper than you think. And only Jesus Christ can set you free. That leads to a third thought this morning. That is, this puts the Gospel into its proper light, doesn't it? What are we preaching Jesus Christ for? What are we offering to men and women in Jesus Christ? What will Jesus Christ do for someone? And what did He do? Listen, what did He do on the cross? You see, if you don't have a real devil, if you don't have real unseen spiritual forces, there are even passages in the Word of God that deal with the cross and what the cross meant that you're going to have to just throw out. For example, in Colossians chapter 2, look over there. And look at verse 8. See to it. See to it, Christian, that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. This stuff you're talking about this morning, Richard, this, this, this archaic Bible stuff. I, listen, we've got psychological explanations, physiological explanations, sociological explanations, that doesn't work. We'll go fate, luck, mystic, right? We'll explain it some way other than the Bible. Do you realize all of that is just Satan's way of trying to hold people in a snare? It's very simple. 
as God has revealed it. Verse 9, For in Him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you've been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with Him in baptism, which you were also in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and He's taken it, taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now notice what else, verse 15, when He had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. Do you know what happened when Jesus Christ shed, His precious blood was shed for the remission of your sins, believer? Someone chosen for salvation before the the, the world was ever made, before you were ever born? Do you realize what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross for you? He took away all of the devil's authority and right concerning you. He disarmed them, took away from them anything they could have ever used on you. Do you realize that? Because all your sins were forgiven. The accuser can come and accuse us before God night and day all he wants to. All of our sins have already been answered for. Where? At the tree. At the tree. And so all the accusations are empty. And any kind of evidence that could ever be used against us in the court of the universe is gone thoroughly disarmed by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Luke chapter 11, you get another picture. Luke chapter 11. And look at verse 14. And He was casting out a demon. And it was dumb. And it came about that when the demon had gone out, the dumb man spoke. And the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. In a Bible study I teach on Thursday mornings, we saw just this past Thursday where there was the Son of God standing right in front of these Jewish leaders and they were so blind and so so in their lostness ignorant that they looked at God in human flesh and they said, He's got a demon. And in the same way, here is the Son of God casting out demons and they say He's doing it by the power of Satan. How blind. Verse 16, And others to test Him, were demanding of Him a sign from heaven. But He knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a, strong man is full, when, when a strong man fully armed guards his own homestead, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. There's much more in that passage than we can deal with this morning, but let me just say this based upon verses 21 and 22. The reason why you are set free from the devil this morning, if you're a Christian, the reason why you're no longer under his dominion is because someone who is stronger than he took his possession and set him free. The gospel is the good news concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in human flesh, who was born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross in the place of sinners, who was raised from the dead, in whom salvation is known. And now God offers to everyone in this place who has not yet received Jesus Christ that if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. What does that mean? It means your sins will be forgiven. Yes. It means the righteousness of Christ will be put to your account. Yes. It means your 
heart will be changed by God. You'll be given a new nature. In fact, that's going to be the only way you can believe. God will have done a work of regeneration in your heart. You'll trust in the Son of God because God has given you life. But something else will have happened. You'll have been set free. Taken from one dominion, the dominion of Satan, and brought into the kingdom of God's own dear Son. Salvation is deliverance. Now, I finish this morning with this thought. This, you see is the position from which we do battle. Not taking the enemy lightly. Not believing or acting as if there's nothing at stake. Not shirking our spiritual responsibility. Not acting as though the truth about the sovereignty of God cancels out all the many verses we've seen this morning who are told to be awake, to be alert, to be sober, not to be ignorant. You see, all those verses... In our theology, all those verses have to be just as true as the truth about God's sovereignty. Qualified by God's sovereignty. Understood properly because of God's sovereignty, but not canceled out. And so we're told not to take the enemy lightly. Be ready, but know that the final outcome has already been decided by our Lord. And we walk each and every day in His triumph. And in in the ultimate sense... If you're born again, the enemy cannot touch you. The only losses you can experience are temporal ones. However, they're important ones. And so you're to do everything in the ability you have given by God with the resources given by God. You're to do everything to stand firm. So that as you go through this life and as the battle rages around you, you're standing. You're standing. And I'm sure you share with me that desire. Amen? I want to stand. I want to stand. Oh, I know my eternity is secure, but you know what? I want to honor and please God now. And I don't want to be found ignorant of the devil's schemes. And I don't want to find myself yielding in areas where I ought not to be yielding. I want to do everything to stand firm. And God has given me everything I need in order to do that. And that's what we're going to begin looking at next Sunday morning. What He has given you so that you can stand firm. Let's bow our heads together, please. With our heads bowed to every believer in this place. How do you think about your salvation? God's salvation given to you. How do you think about it? You thank God. I know that you've been forgiven of your sins. You thank God that you've been given a place in heaven. But when is the last time you really recognized that you used to be living under a different dominion. And that God delivered you out and set you free. Give the Lord praise and thanks that you've been set free. And then perhaps there's somebody sitting here this morning, you recognize that right now you don't have a right relationship with God. You are still in your sins. Deserving of God's wrath. A slave to sin and to Satan. And you need to be delivered. You need to be saved. There's someone mighty enough to set you free. Jesus Christ. And would you from your heart this morning call out to Him, trusting His death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, and trusting His mighty power to save you and set you free. Father in Heaven, thank You for Your precious Word. Lord, these are things we would not know if You hadn't told us. Help us, Lord, to take these things into our hearts, to understand them rightly, and to live for You in the light of these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.